You're about to join Jerry Parker, Maritz Siebert, and Niels Kostrup Larsen on their raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. Jerry Parker, Mort Siebert, and I, Niels Kostrup-Larsen, are back with this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series, where we continue our journey into the world of rules-based investing and share our experience with you each week, hoping that you can find a few golden nuggets to implement in your own investment journey. And if you're tuning in for the first time today, welcome. We love that you are here, and we'll certainly do our best to inform and entertain you about systematic investing during the next hour or so, as usual, let me start by saying good morning to you, Jerry, and good afternoon to you, Moritz. Good afternoon, Niels. Good morning, Jerry. Good morning. Good afternoon. Yeah. Last week, we shared uh, some of the latest uh, iTunes review, by the way, um, that we had received. So um, if you want to help us grow the show, uh, we have made it really easy for all of you. Uh, you just want to go to toptradersonplug.com forward slash review. And there you can see exactly what to do. It should only take a minute or so, but we highly appreciate um, your time. Um, before we jump into all the details uh, for this week, let's uh, let's see what caught my eye. Uh, of course, you know, after a, a Wednesday where it was announced, we had a big uh, build in crude oil supply. And also, I think the WTO were lowering their trade growth forecast. Um, it was quite a tough week for the energy complex. Of course, a little bit kind of ironic um, because only three weeks ago, uh, many of the market participants were fearing much, much higher prices after the attack in Saudi Arabia. And now we're sitting at around uh, two months low for uh, for crude. Um, but of course, it doesn't stop the many experts from continuing to try and convince the audience of these financial news channels that they can, in fact, predict the future market moves of these uh, markets. And... Um, Another thing that caught my eye was just uh, on a, a Bloomberg art article, um, you know, about, uh, you know, the, the thirst and the, the quest for any kind of yield, it would seem. But apparently last month was the largest corporate bond sales. More than $300 billion, uh, was issued in September, uh, which is the highest in, in a single month. Um, and uh, I guess over here in Europe, of course, uh, it's a lot of it is driven by the negative interest rates but of course it has an impact on other types of investors um and i also noticed an article in um i think it was in investment and pensions or pension investments um where they talked about sort of the u.s pension plans and how back in the day many of them were were you know were tracking an eight percent annual return target um but how in the last few years this has really dwindled and uh now there's very few that you know, still have that target uh, as as an achievable goal, um, and um, and and the median, but but still, the median return assumption uh, for these pensions are are still quite high, it's seven point two five percent, and of course, uh, it's hard to find anything that consistently pays seven point two five percent if you go uh, in in into the traditional asset classes uh, at least, um, so. As interest rates or low interest rate environment really um, spreads across the globe, um, it seems like a lot of these pension plans will have to reach even further out the credit curve to to uh, get any kind of return until, of course, they start looking at um, what we do, where we can still find returns. So with all that in mind, Moritz, it's good to have you back. You, We missed you last week, but uh, now that you're back, why don't you take the lead as you normally do and tell us a little bit about uh, your week and trend following. Yeah, great to be back, guys. I missed you, I must say. Um, on the thing about the yields, before I go into the performance, actually, um, for one, you know, when you say go out further on the credit curve, because there may still be some yield, obviously there's a lot of risk out there, probably, too. And um, so I got asked, well, what do you buy? You know, you can't be buying gold because gold doesn't yield anything. I said, well, you know, nothing yields anything these days, really. If you're, you know, on the face of it, (laughs) it doesn't really matter. I mean, show me one high-yielding asset that, you know, I don't think exists anymore these these days. So anyways, performance-wise, I haven't followed it too closely this week. But it's been up. That's that's what I've seen. And uh, we've seen bonds recovering. So that means uh, they're moving higher. 
I've mentioned before that I uh, managed to keep all of my long positions, which turned out to be the right thing to do. Maybe that was just pure luck, but I definitely uh, didn't enjoy the, the way down uh, two or three weeks ago, but I had a good time now moving it back up. And um, the other thing that happened, like, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin was very close in my portfolio of being stopped out, but I kept the long position there. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, still down there. It doesn't look all too good hovering around the 8,000 mark. Um, but not that many changes. Kind of happy that I don't have a substantial position in the energies at that point in time. Uh, relatively small. So the volatilities that we saw in the in the oil markets in the past couple of weeks with, you know, the move higher, close to 60 or even higher than 60, and then now back down to, I don't know where it is, 52, 53. Um, it didn't affect me all too much. So portfolio is in is in good shape um thus far this year uh looks pretty good so i'm happy about that and hopefully that's going to continue in that in that fashion for the fourth quarter now yeah the fourth quarter is always interesting uh certainly in the past has proven to be at least certain years has been incredibly profitable for our kind of strategies but just to follow up on what you said i mean a couple of things spring to mind uh, I love the fact that you didn't touch uh, anything in terms of your bonds. Of course, the people at Nomura, uh, who loves to talk about how we were causing this massive sell-off uh, as a strategy uh, a, a few weeks ago. Uh, of course, um, we don't hear much from them uh, right now, uh, neither the people at Bloomberg who love to uh, quote them. Um, and, you know, same with energy, right? I mean, how much trading did... CTAs really do uh, in that little blip up, uh, and then the uh, reversal has been pretty swift as well. So, um, yeah, I would bet that a lot of our fellow uh, trend followers um, have not really had much to do really in the last uh, few weeks in some of these major uh, asset classes, despite the fact that there's been a bit of volatility um, for sure. Um so far, first week of October, which for us uh, on our side is, is quite a special month because at the end of this month, we will have completed our 45th year in business and 35 years of track record for the WMA strategy. So it's nice to see that it's in good spirit uh, in the first week of October. Uh, lower energy prices and higher fixed income prices, just like you, Moritz, certainly leading the charge on our side. Um, equities came under pressure this week, of course, despite uh, a little bit of a uh, attempt to save some of the losses uh, based on yesterday's jobs report, or maybe rather the hope that no more easing is coming, uh, more easing is coming. Um, so, uh, but anyways, uh, so we lost a bit of on equities, uh, maybe except Japan. Japan was still short on that, so uh, so that worked all right. Commodities, currencies for us this week has been really mixed um, and no real performance impact um, either way. So, you know, good start to the month, uh, to the quarter, still very solid year. So uh, not complaining. Um, and we'll see, as you say, the next uh, 10 weeks will decide what the year is going to look like when history books are written. What about you, Jerry? Um, how, was, how was your week? I think it was a pretty quiet week. <clears throat> probably profitable given uh, the metals recovered a little and the dollar is still pretty strong. Uh, stocks made a nice uh, comeback. Uh, my friend who works for a macro firm told me that uh, everyone there blamed the CTAs during the week for the big stock sell-offs. So that was funny. Um, but the energies I'm kind of interested in, in the sense that, uh, I pay attention to um, the sort of uh, consolidation in the market and how long it's sort of chopped around. And so uh, when I was on the TD Ameritrade TV show over the past six months, I just kept saying, you know, since this big sell-off last year in energy, I just, nothing's going to happen there for six months or nine months. It just has to work itself out and vol needs to go lower. We need to have some choppiness and uh, it, turned, it turned out to be 100% right, even though I would have gotten long or short if it would have uh, made new highs or lows. But um, I do think that's a pretty big part of trading sometime is uh, you need uh, the markets that you're looking at to be kind of boring and low vol and not a lot of excitement. And uh, so whenever you get uh, lots of volatility in the middle of a sort of a consolidation or a period where there hasn't been trends, uh, 
probably doesn't bode too well for any sort of uh, soon-to-be opportunities. So I think uh, that's just something I sort of add to my trading sometime to speed up the trade or slow it down. Uh, if it's been a really bad chart pattern, I'll speed it up. <clears throat> so, uh, but I'm kind of fascinated by by those energies. Yeah, well, you know, boring, uneventful, that kind of is good, usually good news for us. Um, and and I guess a lot of people may not uh, be aware, but often what happens when you get into these really strong trends, uh, you know, very often volatility of those price trends goes down. So, uh, you know, volatility tends to increase around the turning point. So when things calm down, it's uh, usually not a bad sign uh, for for what we do. I think there was quite a few interesting tweets. Uh, I, I, I'm looking at one of the things you tweeted with a link to an article, but I'm not going to take your uh, take your um, words out of your mouth. So I don't know what you're going to suggest we talk about today, uh, Jerry. But um, how was how was the uh, were there more excitement in Twitter land than in 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 the markets this week? Oh well, you know, it depends on your point of view. Uh, I. Yeah, but uh, don't forget that one because if you liked it, I'll probably like it as well. And sometimes it's sort of <laughs> random the ones that I choose. Uh, uh, let's I get see a little if you don't mention it. I get a little upset when I tweet something that's really great and two people like it. So, but uh, you know what? Uh, I have last week. I think we may have talked about it, but we should talk about it again. This is a tweet mm -hmm. that's my most popular tweet of all time, and I had no idea. And it's somebody else's quote, of course. That's what it's I do. More, is it Morgan it's, Housel? Ah, uh, no, no, no. Oh, wow. it's not. Uh, but uh, we'll let Moritz uh, opine on this as well. And this is like this is uh, what turned on my Twitter twenty thousand Twitter followers more than anything I've ever tweeted. So g go figure. And so I think maybe why did this? Uh, why do they like this so much? This would be one way of looking at it, and I'd like to hear your opinion on this, but it goes like this. You don't win by predicting the future. You win by getting the odds right. Bet on the one more likely to win than most people expect. That's the one that gives you the best odds. That's the bet that pays off over time. I thought that was Morgan Housel, actually. That's why I was, that was the one I was thinking about. I think it's fantastic. I, I think it's great. I mean, um, I'm just, you know, looking at it, the, the last sentence, that's the one that gives you the best odds. That's the one that pays off over time. I mean, isn't this exactly what we do, right? We're using our stats to exactly do this, right? No ifs, no buts. We're not predicting the future. We don't even know what's going to happen in the next minute or five minutes or day or month, right? But, I mean, the way I look at the way we trade is that we have that statistical body of evidence without knowing the future, but we have detected some structural patterns or, you know, behavior in the markets that has played out in the past, which, you know, if you, if you want, you can say that produces the odds for us, right? If we follow that system, then the odds should be in our favor. And that's what, that's what we bank on, to be, to be quite frank. Um, and it's, you know, it's a difficult, you know, process to, to, to follow, but this is what we do over and over and over again. Um, and it's, yeah, just, just like that tweet says. So I couldn't agree more. I, I like it. It's funny you say no ifs, no but, but there's an art, and there's another tweet you sent out this week, Jerry, and maybe you're going to get onto that. But there was someone who said about trend following that there were too many ifs, actually. Is that right? Do you remember that tweet? Oh, yeah. That's, uh, yeah, and it comes from uh, sort of a CTA, Managed Futures uh, firm. Yeah. Uh, I think they were ex expressing some frustration, and I so totally get it that. Uh, so many people, so many CTAs and in, in the industry in general would certainly prefer us to diversify not only in the markets, but in the strategy. And a lot of people have. My contention has always been uh, that's probably a lot of marketing and a high, high percentage of returns is going to come from the trend following versus uh, mean reversion, the carry trade, pattern recognition, short term, whatever. Uh, they've come up with. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, so it goes like this. Trend following has too many ifs. They can make money in a stock downturn if it doesn't come into it long stocks. 
if there's movement in other markets like bonds and FX at the same time, if the move seems sees follow through of weeks to months and so forth. Investors are sort of getting sick <laughs> of all of the ifs. They want instant gratification, and maybe these people too, from their alts. And trend following feels too passive and too if-based for many. And that's a group I've worked with, and they're a champion of the industry. So, oh, OMG. How about yeah. people who don't like us and who are not in the well, industry? Really, OMG. I mean, <laughs> yeah. can you tell me or can, can the two of you tell me you know, one single trading strategy out there that is not dependent on ifs. Even the long only buy and hold type of guys, there's a big if there. You know, it only makes money if the market's going up, not if it's moving sideways, not, not if it's going down, right? Every strategy has an if attached to it. And, you know, really when, you know, it comes down to, you know, we're, we're placing bets in the markets, you know, whether people like that word or not and they feel they're a trader or investor. To me, it's really all about you're, you're placing a bet in the market and we're in that game to make money. It's actually also like, you know, the tweet that we heard earlier with don't predict the future, just get the odds on your side. That's also what Larry Hyde was saying when he did his podcast two or three weeks ago with, um, I think, with uh, Chat with Traders, saying, you know, I, I don't know anything about the outcome of a single trade, but over time, I'd like to be the casino. I'll, I'll have the odds in my favor. Of course, you know, this may change. You know, it, it may require a hundred or a thousand bets or trades for that ought to reveal itself. Um, but but it usually does. And that that is what we do. It always has a big, big if. There's never certainty about the way we trade or any other trading strategy. No, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I think that, that, you know, I think that is very true. That, of course, there's always certain conditions uh, that has to be met in order for any strategy to make money. So to say that we have more ifs than anyone else is just ridiculous. Um, but I do think we need to, I think we need to kind of put our, you know, foot down at some point and say, let, let's just, let's just stop. Let's just stop talking negatively about what we do all the time and the performance and so on and so forth. I mean, many of our strategies, many of our peers uh, you know, we are we were at all time highs or pretty close to all time highs a month ago, right? So what are we complaining about? We're not really. I mean, we shouldn't be complaining. People shouldn't be complaining about, you know, a, a period of time where performance has struggled. And by the way, performance are always quoted against these indices, right? And the indices are made up by the big firms. And the big firms, yeah, they probably have struggled, but I think they have struggled because they're too big. Uh, in that article that Jerry was quoting, I'm just reading through it now, and I'm that I see that they quote massive outflows of AQR's managed futures program. Well, maybe it was too big to deliver strong returns. Um, certainly, as I said, you know, uh, because we've done a little bit of analysis, given the fact that we're coming up to some some anniversaries on our side, and you know, our performance is not worse than than it was, uh, you know, early on. In fact, it's probably a little bit better. So. I just think we have to stop as an industry to talk ourselves down. Um, there's no need for that. What we do is is great. We 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 serve a very important role in any portfolio, and and that's what we should focus on. And sure, if you want to buy something cheap, you probably will get lower returns. I I I truly believe that. I've seen no evidence from some of these cheap replicators that they can compete with premium managers like the three of us. Um, and I've seen no evidence. That some of the shorter term managers who claim that they are uh, the trend followers are not providing the same level of convexity and blah blah blah, um, or for that matter that uh, you know trend following is becoming too crowded, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I see no evidence when I compare the, their numbers to our numbers. I see no evidence of that. So I think I think it's a lot of talk and a lot of nonsense. Um, but I think we have to change the conversation. I know we are trying, uh, but and maybe we need to work a little bit harder on this, but there's just too many people out there talking the strategy down. So I'm not surprised that investors sit back and think, oh, but why should I even look at managed futures? But because even these guys who work in that space feel it's not doing so well. I think that's, um, I think it's wrong. And I think we should um, hopefully be able to make it a little bit more nuanced and objective and not just look at these big indices as a proxy for all managers. I mean, how, how often, when you talk about hedge fund managers, you often talk about specific managers doing really well. We should do the same. There are, there are CTAs, trend followers out there who are doing still really well. Are we, 
obviously saw saw one of the articles uh, on in the news this week about a, a fellow Swiss manager um, that that we all know uh, getting you know great reviews uh, in in the press. So we should find more of those cases and we should talk it up. We should get journalists to focus on that and don't just lump us into the average of the industry. Um, anyways, that was my rant for today. I think. Yeah, like I said last week, I think it's so important to, uh, you know, acknowledge that this is, we look at this as a um, <clears throat> pretty risky situation to put your money in the markets, whether it's stocks or futures. And uh, looking at this as a bet is perfectly fine, and it's the right mentality to have. Uh, some sort of crazy way, the trader type, the speculator type who like us, is incredibly diversified and with longs and shorts, takes uh, small losses, has a systematic approach with rules, pays attention only to price, uh, <clears throat> is perceived to be, you know, in some circles would be less than uh, it, that we should be compared to these uh, amazing uh, morally and ethically superior investors who along a bunch of stocks that have gone up as if they uh, have anything to do with that except uh, owning them and drinking the Kool-Aid and looking at buy and hold as some sort of religious experience. And then, of course, always being susceptible to 50% or whatever percent drawdowns. Uh, and the rule is buy more. Uh, so I think this is uh, the proper way to look at things. And like most things in life, uh, <clears throat> the conventional wisdom has it backwards. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. What else happened um, inside your Twitter feed this uh, week, Jerry, that um, will spark some more discussion on our side? Well, you know, this one was popular, but it's a topic we've talked about a lot, and it uh, did come from uh, Morgan Housel. It's always good for, I look forward to Fridays, <clears throat> just to see what he's going to write. He wrote an amazing piece this week that has little to do with this quote, but it was in there. Uh, so for my purposes, I will use it. Uh, the world is driven by tail events. A minority of things drive the majority of outcomes. It's one of the most important concepts in investing, where a few positions may account for most of your lifetime returns. History is no different. Lawrence? I'm reading through that. I, uh, you know, we all know that, and we've, you know, mentioned that repeatedly on that show, that, you know, strange things and things which nobody expects, they occur more frequently than anybody would love to admit, right? But still, that's the case. So those are the tail events. Um, not all of them are black swans. It's just, you know, some are the uh, those extreme events. And uh, I, I believe it's true that they drive a lot of the overall returns. I mean, I've seen studies where, you know, if you took out, I, I don't know what it was, like the 20 or 30 um, largest S&P returns, your performance really deteriorate to close to nothing, right? So you, you really depend on those outlier returns and you need to be there, which also to me means that I cannot pause my trading system. There's just no way to time those type of things, right? You're either in the markets trading or you're not, but it's it's impossible to time those type of events. You need to have a robust strategy that will be able to work with those type of markets when they throw a curveball and uh and so that they don't hurt you and i think that's also you know i like like we said i mean we, we don't know when the next tail event's coming but you know in this day and age like we've said before i mean stocks seem to be relatively high i'm not saying that they cannot go higher neither are you right but it's kind of like you know the feeling out there seems that you know valuations may be stretched and stocks seem to be high and we're at a very late cycle this has been going on for 10 years yields are negative or very low high yield bonds are trading super high so it's kind of like you know every every trade or every asset that you want to touch real estate prices are high in most regions of the world everything feels expensive and therefore risky and you know when when i then look back at what i'm doing i'm kind of happy that i'm trading with a trend following trading system um that you know it doesn't it doesn't really matter if prices are high if they're going higher, then great, then I'll follow them. But if they stop, then I'll be protected. And I don't think that most people have that in their portfolios, or at least not enough. Yeah, I mean, it reminded me, the quote kind of reminded me of, I think it was uh, Jim O'Shaughnessy who uh, 
on some kind of podcast I listened to were explaining a little bit of how sort of markets work. And he was talking about how most of the time a market has a really fine balance between buyers and sellers based on the information that they they um, they all get. But then you get periods where everyone just seems to be moving in the same direction. For whatever new piece of information you get, everybody seems to be suddenly become buyers or suddenly become sellers for a period of time. And they create these big shifts or trends or, or, or events, tail events or, or, or what have you. And so, yeah, I mean, of course you would expect that these things, uh, you know, uh, will continue to, to um, that it will continue to operate like that. And and um, and certainly our strategies and a few other strategies are, are very well positioned to to um, you know make a make you know profit from from some of these events, not all of them for sure, um, but 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 from you know a good part of them. Look, the the one thing I will say is that you know these these tough events, those tail events, extreme events, they will pop up again in the future. You know, I think I'm ready to make a bet on that. The last 10 years have been so incredibly smooth, right? With a 60-40 bond equity portfolio outperforming pretty much everything um, that's out there. And most people or many people, don't want to say most, but many people don't even remember the last big crisis, right? So it's kind of like we're blinded by this decade of super smooth buy and hold kind of returns. But when you look at the history of markets, I mean... There have been those periods which have been extremely wild and distorting and full of tail events all over the place, right? And none of us can outsmart history. I mean, you know, I'm, I, I'm definitely not betting on that. What, what is clear is that, you know, I, I don't want to opine on the valuation of equities, but, the, you know, the world is, has a lot of debt. You know, I think never has debt been so high in all of the developed countries there's a trade war going on, there's geopolitical tensions, there's this and that and the other. Do I really want to be going out buying and holding stocks at that point in time, or do I want to have a strategy that will get me out of those positions if they turn around and turn against me? That seems uh, private equity is the way to go, Moritz. <laughs> yeah, well, that, let's definitely do private equity and only mark that thing every every quarter, every year, and you know, uh, cushion all over the, uh, over the volatility that happens in the interim and charge a higher price for that. No, I don't want to be going into private equity at all. Not, like, I'm, I'm not touching that. Um, no, I'm not, not even getting close to that. <laughs> private equity is a tremendous bubble. It's uh, right up there with negative interest rates. But uh, I listen to people on Twitter and even people that I like and who know about trend following, they, they repeat this back that um, the prospects for stocks in the future are so low because stocks are so high. And it's uh, just a situation that we don't have to deal with where exactly. uh, we have other markets, let's say. But even if I only traded stocks, I think my expectation in the stocks that I traded would be the same as it's always been. It would be a few ATRs per trade. I'll have some longs. I'll have some shorts. I'll have some diversification. Um, so just we're not even in that uh, situation where we have to – our philosophy, our strategy is telling us, you know – uh, we're not going to make good money in the future. Uh, <clears throat> we don't even look at it that way. It's it's a sort of a depressing thing to be able to predict uh, that you're not going to stocks are not going to do well. The the one big asset that everybody wants to hold. It's also very nice to be free of the obligation to make predictions, right? It's you know we're not in that business. We don't have to spend our time thinking too much ahead. We just know that something will be thrown at us and we'll have to deal with it. Um, but, you know, going out there and forming an opinion on what's going to happen in the next month, next quarter, or next year, and then be proving wrong because that is what normally happens, kind of feels good to be out of that business and not, not carry that burden. Let other people do that. If they want to be a salesman or sell their business and, you know, do something with that, that's, that's just not us. Well, for one, when you don't make predictions, you're never wrong. So that's a good start, I would imagine. Um, but um, just going back to the private equity, I actually had dinner with a few uh, hedge funds uh, here in, in, in uh, Switzerland um, a couple of days ago. One of them used to work for one of the really big U.S. firms um, that went public early on. Um, and and he, was, he was saying, well, you know, what you never hear about these funds are that um, – 
uh, uh, the returns that are quoted about how great is private equity, it's all based on predictions really about what they expect. When you look at the actual returns, you know, that are realized when everything is said and done and all the exits are in and all of that stuff, it's not quite as good as 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 as, as they claim. Um, and he was certainly aware of a few funds where, you know, they, they're still in them and the firms are still charging their, you know, one and a half, two percent management fee, but they just can't get out of the last few positions. So not necessarily a great in, uh, situation to be in if you're an investor. But those uh, stories never really make it to the um, to the news flow. What else, uh, Jerry, did you want to share with us today? Um, so let's do another Morgan Housel. I mean, uh, let's do that. I like this one. Uh, no investment strategy is proven until it survived a calamity. Things that can thrive while the wind is at their back outnumber those that can endure the complete wrath of the real world 100 to 1. A strategy that's only viable when everything is moving in the right direction can look the most impressive. But markets survive on a steady diet of fragile ignorance, chewing it up and spitting it out whenever it's exposed. Pretty funny. Love it. Yep. So we've definitely been through some calamities. Uh, our own performance, let's say, you know, taking small losses, not having a lot of trends, but I think... Uh, you know, 2008 calamity is probably what they're talking about. Uh, you got to have those shorts. You've got to have a rule to get you out uh, when the trend starts to turn. And it's always nice to have some commodities and FX in the portfolio as well. So I think, uh, you know, one thing that CTAs do is survive. I think people do get sick and tired of churning water and not making money. But we do have a tendency the strategy is built upon the idea of survival. I think it's true, and I think you know. I think um, uh, as 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 I've mentioned before, I mean there aren't that many strategies that I've can find that has you know track records as long as as uh, as in the CTA space. Um, the problem with long track records are that they can look volatile, and um, because clearly um, you know investors had different appetites. Uh, certainly, when we got started, volatility wasn't a big thing, and you could even attract inv- investors who liked volatility because they understood the efficiency of of their capital invested. You know, uh, so so they didn't mind that um, the um, the institutionalization of our industry has really uh, changed that. And uh, now everyone is kind of afraid of losing money. And so we try and make us look safer, less volatile. Um, but when you deal with inherently volatile uh, markets, you know, putting them through any kind of model, uh, even a trend following model is not going to f- remove the volatility magically. So, you know, we have to expect that volatility. But certainly, I think that um, the institutionalization, the investor base in in, in uh, CTAs and hedge funds in general, has driven down uh, this, and and everybody is looking for that elusive smooth return profile with very small losses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yet they completely ignore, as Jerry often quote, the fact that where they have most of their assets, which is in equities, that is really an eight percent return strategy with a fifty percent plus uh, drawdown profile. That, that has not changed. Um, it's just that we've forgotten about it. Um, and as, as you also said, uh, Moritz, I mean, many uh, investors, many people working on Wall Street, so to speak, or in any financial center, have never experienced a crisis, let alone a period of interest rates going up. And we know interest rates going up can have detrimental effect on not just interest rates as an asset class, but on many other things. But we haven't seen that for 35 uh, plus years now. Um, so what's going to happen when 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 that starts to uh, to turn? You know that that wish of the market or the wish of the investor to have steady and smooth returns, as we have said before, I believe. I mean, without being able to prove it, but I believe that this is building up a lot of risk uh, for investors. You know, it's very risky behavior um, to build a system or be focused on the trading strategy that is. It is only smooth because I think it has a lot of hidden risk. You know, you're building something that has risks hidden away, probably in the left tail, 
because, you know, in a simple way, that's akin to selling out of the money put. So, you know, doing some mean reversion type of strategies, all of those type of things, they warehouse risk in a hidden part of the distribution that's not immediately available to see. That's very different to what you and I are doing or the three of us are doing, where that risk shows up in very frequent small losses and it's difficult to cope with for, for most people. But the other, the alternative of being this like smooth and steady guy has existential risk for the portfolio. And one point that I um, I always have difficulties with because it also, you know, comes back to our business which is when, when we say, okay, well, as a business, we also have to deliver or maybe do what clients want us to do. And we have to give them what they want for a fee, right? Because then the client is happy. But if that requires us to produce strategies which have risks hidden in their tails and then give that to clients because that's the way to build a business, I don't think that sounds too nice. And I don't think that's the right way to go about it. So I'd rather have the strategy stay pure and maybe volatile and more difficult to cope with, but have a better a better relationship, explanatory relationship with the client and say that, you know, this is what you have to accept if you want to survive in those markets. And survival, again, let me quote Larry Heitler, you know, three weeks ago when he was on that chat with Traders podcast or two weeks ago, whenever it was, he also said it like all the other guys that have survived for years and years and years. Rule number one is survive in those markets. That is the most important thing. Do not go out of business. You don't get a second chance, most of the time at least, unless somebody stakes you again. But survive. If you have a drawdown, if there's volatility, if there's losses in the, in, you know, it doesn't really matter if you have a robust strategy that will keep you in those markets for the long run with a positive return expectancy. Just survive and don't take those hidden risks. And I think this is probably one of the most important things that if you trade in those markets that you really have to embrace and understand and come to terms with there is no steady way up there is no smooth way up there is no building a business around that if you want to you know produce those fair and honest returns they will be volatile that that is my belief and i think that's one of the reasons we make money is because we've looked at the data and said i don't like it but i like making money more i like being safe and, and having a, an approach that has a, a reasonable return with reasonable risk. That's why I've always kind of not been a cheerleader for the idea that, well, find something that suits your personality. <clears throat> well, this just definitely does not suit my personality. If you want to trade short term, then find something short term. If you want to trade counter trade, no. You know, I want to find something that's going to work. And more than likely, it's part of the reason it's going to work is because people don't like it in general. So, I mean, that's, a, that's from 1983. You know, that was one of the big turtle tenants. Uh, trading is hard. You don't, you probably won't like the things you have to do <clears throat> and search out for those things and be willing to do them. Uh, so yeah, it's versus uh, expecting, you know, a long only approach to continue to work forever and uh, just sit with, uh, the debilitating drawdowns that can occur, 50%, can be small sometimes. Yeah, and I think, you know, when you talk about um, Larry Hyde and and and, and this, um, you know, mantra about first and foremost survive, I mean, what he really says uh, in, in the book is that it's it's back to the rule. You know, what is the rule? And the rule is cut your losses short. I mean, that's the rule in his opinion. And then there's a few extra things you add on to that. Um but I think also, I mean, again, you uh, we, we, when we talk about these things, I mean, it's funny when we so we're in the, we're in the machine room every day. We see it from the inside. We've seen it for firsthand for decades, right? And we feel very um, confident. We feel very safe with that investment approach. But it's interesting to see that to many people, it's the complete reverse, right? They see what we do as being incredibly risky. Um, and and so to me that's that's incredibly interesting that that people can see look at the same thing uh, in two so different ways. 
But, you know, again, going back to, I think, your, your point, Moritz, you know, we don't need to be everything for everyone. We don't need to please everyone. And I think that the our industry as a whole, um, maybe we are trying to please, uh, you know, the very, very large investors, the pension plans, the endowments, et cetera, et cetera. And in order to please them, we have to change. But we could also just say, well, why don't we just stay true to what we do and we manage money for those investors who like what we do instead of trying to be liked by everyone. We just stick to what we do and there should be enough investors out there to to make a business of it. Um, but we don't have to um, we don't have to change uh, just to uh, please a wider uh, you know audience, so to speak. Just stay, stay true to what we believe in, and those who like what we do, they will find us, and they will, and they will join us. Um, so um, I think that's um, important. they will change their mind, yeah, and they'll see the benefits, and they already kind of see the benefits. Good stuff. Lots of things to uh, talk about. Um, do you want to take some questions? Do you want to do more? I mean, there's lots of good um, things that come out of. Uh, Jerry this is, uh, this this is, uh, let's do this, make this the last one. And I, my link uh, doesn't work any longer, but this was an interview on Real Vision that <clears throat> Moritz told me about. I can't think of the guy's name. Uh, but he had a really good quote, and I think he's like a uh, private equity guy. But, uh, you know, there's overlap in good investment philosophy, regardless of how you do it, what your ideas are. And once again, uh, he goes, if your entire model is based on mildly good foresight into the future, and the future is completely unpredictable, then that entire exercise is merely an attempt to increase your confidence that you're increasing your accuracy. So it's doubly bad. So you're like, no one believes in forecasting or predicting the future. I mean, they, they say they don't. They talk like they do, but if you put it to them, I think very few people will say, oh yeah, I can predict the future. But nonetheless... I think uh, sometimes their actions uh, betray that that idea that uh, you can't predict the future. Uh, it's the first thing I like to say to clients. No one knows where these markets are going. Uh, follow the price. The stock market is not inherently superior, not a better trender. Yeah, it's just a matter of time before things kind of get back to normal for us, I guess. Yeah, if it's the private equity guy, maybe that was Daniel Rasmussen. Yeah, Dan Rand, Rand you? Yeah, yeah, could be. Uh, yeah, that was the one. Yeah, yeah. I think what what he um, what he said in this interview is that a lot of the private equity returns they can be replicated by being long leveraged small cap stocks, and you know, for much lower fees, better liquidity, better transparency, no lockups, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's just a better investment experience. Of course, you know that you know he modeled that. I, I don't know exactly how he modeled it, but um, my hunch is that there is a lot of truth behind that. Because when you look at leveraged small cap performance, it pretty much looks like private equity performance. Good stuff, guys. Okay, um, let's look at the um, questions. First one, right? So this is a little bit of a different question. Um, so, which we're happy to take as well. So we'll be challenged on a wider range of knowledge, um, but it's from Chris who says, unfortunately he can't and make it to our New York event, um, but he had a question. Uh, so we'll definitely be happy to uh, take that. And by the way, there's only probably one space left that we would like to fill uh, at the live event. We now have also our our special guest coming, uh, Denise Scholl. Uh, probably many of you will know her as a uh, trading slash performance coach. So that's going to be super exciting for all of us. Uh, so if you're interested, um, uh, you can still secure the last uh, space. Just uh, send me an email, info at toptradersonplot.com if you want to join us in a couple of weeks. Anyways, Chris writes... Um, how many basis points do you think an individual should pay in fees, data fees, commissions, etc.? Question mark. I'm asking because my broker charges for the data feed uh, of the softs like cotton, sugar, etc. Right now, my account is too small to include uh, these extra fee 
Uh, I'm thinking around 300 basis points per year would be about the most I would want to spend on these fees. I would then back into what my account balance would uh, should be and handle these fees without being too much of a problem. So that's the first thing about, you know, fees. And I'm, um, uh, I mean, just to give my view, I'm not entirely sure whether I answer your question correctly here, Chris, but... If it's about data, uh, I and again we we are not supported by this uh, company, but it's a company that I have uh, used for for many many years, and I think they are very reliable at very good price. And that's CSI. Um, CSI is a data provider, end of day data. Um, I think it's like five or six hundred dollars a year flat fee, and you get all the futures data you need. Um, so that that's how I would uh, approach that. Um, uh, any of you guys have any view on data and fees and stuff like that? I uh, like to look at, uh, I have uh, Bloomberg and CQG, but I also like to log into bar chart, barchart.com. It does a nice charting and different features that are sort of free. And uh, <clears throat> the data is free. It's uh, delayed data. I um, see no problem with uh calculating the trades that you want to do at the close and then executing them on the next open. And so that would be a situation where the real-time data, the latest and greatest price is not that critical. And since I, my average holding period is uh, shockingly, uh, you know, around 12 months, uh, I'm kind of not, I mean, for the long haul, not uh, to make sure <clears throat> I get some sort of special fill or price when I put the trade on. So uh, there's a lot of, there, there's a handful of really good uh, options out there if you uh, want to save some money, I think. And money, and the fees are coming down. Uh, oh, yeah. Interactive Brokers and some of the other firms announced this week free stock trading. Uh, there's some loopholes there. I, I mean, there's some, uh, I think Schwab was willing to do it, but they're going to take a lot of your interest income, but there's not a lot of interest income to be had. So got to be careful with these seemingly uh, amazing deals. Do they take the negative interest income from us as well? <laughs> but speaking of that, I mean, you mentioned uh, a firm which is obviously very well known by many people. Um, but I will say, uh, I just had a client uh, coming into our fund this month and uh, he said that, okay, they might be cheap on some things, but they charged him 4% to make a wire transfer out of his account, which I think is just outrageous. But uh, So be careful. It's not always as good as it seems. Uh, Moritz, I want to maybe get you involved on the next uh, question that Chris has. Um, and that is, do your rules follow the front month contract or one, or the one with most open interest? Along the same lines, do you, your rule follow the continuous contract data or the month that you are trading? I keep a spreadsheet um, that I do my trades off. Um, it does differ from the continuous contract a little bit. I follow my spreadsheet and not the continuous contract. Just wondering if there's a reasoning to do it differently. So, Marge, I know you're an expert in this. <laughs> so, in, with so many other things, you're an expert in. But uh... well, I'm not so sure about this. But uh, I, I definitely roll my contracts and I back adjust them for differences. So that's that's how I do it. And um, I'd say for most of the markets I trade, I am in what's called the front month contract. Right. So, for instance, if I'm trading the DAX contract or, I don't know, the Eurostox contract, Hang Seng, whatever it is, that is generally the front month contract, meaning there is one contract that is actively traded, which is the nearest to expiration. That's where the liquidity is. That's where the open interest is. And then I roll out of that contract and into the next contract depending on a specific role schedule that I have developed for myself. That is not dependent on open interest. I know there are people out there which roll as a function of open interest, like when the open interest changes from one contract to the next, then that triggers a role. I don't do it. I have a role schedule that uses days where I say, you know, I want to roll two days prior to a last trade or one week prior to a last trade or two weeks or three weeks prior to first notice, whatever the case may be. Now, there are some contracts... Uh, the short-term interest rate contracts, for example, where you can see the full strip or a large part of the strip that's available trading very liquidly. 
Um, so that allows me to trade, for instance, the June 2020 euro dollar contract. It also allows me to trade the June 2022 euro dollar contract, right? Rather than just the next um, expiry month, which now is December of 2019. And the reason I do that is because if I only trade December 2019, that is now a very involatile contract. Whereas, say, you're trading two years or three years out in the short-term interest rates, that gives you a greater amount of volatility. It's still, you know, the future price of three-month interest rates, but, you know, forward now in three years' time. Um, and I do similar things in some of the commodity markets. So, for instance, um, when I look at WTI, um, of course, you can trade the front-month contract, and, and that is also something that I do. But I also trade the contract that six month out, and I trade the contract that twelve month out. Um, both of those are liquid, and they tend to behave in, you know, of course, in a correlated way, similar way, but yet different enough for me to include them as markets in my portfolio and get a little bit of diversification benefit from trading um, along the curve and not just on one point. Very detailed answer. I hope that was exactly what you were looking for. Chris, do you want to add something? Uh, oh, here? just that you were right. He is the expert. Um, yeah. I think that I don't have much to add. I think uh, <clears throat> my opinion is probably not a lot to be gained or lost either way. I don't know how you do these things. And uh, it's kind of common sense, I guess. But uh, just maintain uh, discipline and consistency. Choose your rules on how to execute and how to roll and how to do all these things and just uh, stick by your rules like you do on your entries and exits and things like that. So I think that's the most important, uh, most important idea. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I so just, just uh, to, to reiterate that, uh, Chris, I mean, I would say um, don't, don't spend too much. I, I don't think there's much of an edge, uh, you know, in the long term, uh, whether you roll one day uh, or, or another day, as, as long as it's close to when uh, everyone else is rolling, I think you'll be just fine. So, um, so yeah. But I mean, regarding the continuous contract, I mean, in my opinion, the only way you really can do proper research is by using a continuous contract. And I think there's something to be had for saying that, you know, you, you test what you trade and you trade what you test. So don't, don't, don't do one live and one in your testing. You do, do the, do the same, uh, you know, keep it, keep it the same. I think that's important. That's also just to add to that. I think this is extremely important to backtest the system in exactly the way you would trade it going live. And, and to me, that necessitates that when you do those, when you build those continuous contracts, you have to adjust them for the difference at the time of the rollover. There is another role methodology, which is to adjust based on ratios. But, you know, there's advantages to doing that. The advantage is that you don't get negative prices when you back adjust. But the disadvantage is that you keep your notional exposure constant and it, you know, uh, leads to fractional contracts, which is nothing that we can trade in the real world. So back adjusting for differences is, for me, the proper thing uh, when you do a back test. Yeah. But I think uh, you can tr – I don't have a problem with trading uh, the contract itself. I kind of prefer it. I prefer – I wish I could just trade the contract and not trade um, the continuous. But my holding period is – my look back is too long. But I don't have a problem – with trading it, because you're going to run into situations where you should absolutely trade the contract because the difference between old crop and new crop is two different, it's two different markets almost, corn, uh, soybeans, wheat, things like that. So I think sometimes the continuous, uh, probably once again, not a hugely material thing, but uh, I've actually been in meetings and talked about it and clients have called me out on it and said, no, 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 you're 100% wrong. Uh, old crop, new crop, corn is two different markets. And so I think be consistent. I And just uh, so many of these choices we make, they're not the perfect choice, but continuing to do whatever you choose to do, just be consistent and implement it. Uh, the way we've talked about, I think, is uh, a good idea. Yeah. I mean, of course, you would always trade the actual, you know, contract, uh, for, for, you know, for sure. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Jacob has a question, a few questions for us. Um, he says, um, have you 
known or encountered any CTAs with an extremely low frequency strategy? That's the first question. I think I can answer at least from my experience on that, Jacob, and that is um, Scott Billington firms, uh, firm, which of course escapes me right now, but you know who I'm talking about, right, Jerry and Moritz? Uh, Covenant. Oh, it's it's uh, Covenant, of Covenant course. Capital yeah. Management. Yeah, yeah. Covenant. I think out of Tennessee or something like that. Yeah, they used to be. I'm not so sure they still ex exist, but I interviewed Scott back in the day, and uh, and they were doing it on weekly charts. So I think that's certainly low frequency, uh, the lowest I've seen uh, in my experience. Have you seen anything similar, Moritz and Jerry, or any any other low frequency? I've seen Maybe. monthly. Okay. Um, and um, you know the I you know I I, I kind of like those systems to be honest. Um, because, first of all, they follow. They tend to follow long-term trends, which is something that the three of us like too, right? So they they tend to get the longer-term trends in in the ways that that we capture them. Now, the undisputable advantage that you have when you trade with a low frequency and very long-term is that your transaction costs are much lower um, versus an alternative where you're trading with a higher frequency and shorter term. And that money um, adds up, you know, and if you're trading long term in an infrequent way, then you're kind of like, you know, by that amount of trading cost that you save ahead of the pack, if you will. That's the advantage. The disadvantage may be higher drawdowns, right? A more volatile return stream. So it, it is, again, one of those things where it's a matter of taste. Uh, what is it that you prefer? But... I, you know, I've tested a lot of those, you know, very infrequent long-term trading systems. And it is my opinion that they are not, you know, to be disliked. I, you know, there is, there is some good, good stuff there. Yeah, you're clicking on, at least on my side, uh, Moritz, you're clicking a little bit in and out. So I'm not sure whether people can actually uh, hear your full answer. Uh, I know you were uh, saying you, you kind of like the idea of long-term and, and you can save some money on cost, but... I will say to that that if you are generally a medium to long term trend follower, uh, maybe you trade around a thousand round turns per million per year. If you pay five bucks round turn, that's half a percent commission cost on a yearly basis. I mean, how much does it really matter whether you half that again? I don't think it really matters, to be honest. And uh, I think as long as your commissions are not, you know, outrageous, um, which of course with the shorter term strategies they can be. But some managers still find to, uh, or still seem to be able to find an edge to overcome that. But I mean, for a lot of trend following, I mean, commissions uh, on a yearly basis is you know half, one, one and a half percent. So I think there's a limited uh, amount that uh, you know improvement you can get from reducing or changing your strategy just because you're paying one percent commission. I think that that the, people shouldn't, in my opinion, people shouldn't invest in trend following if they're trying to make a, an additional 50 basis points. I mean, that's that's the wrong uh, way of looking at it. That's not what we're trying to to deliver anyway. Um, so, Well, I, I don't know of anyone who's longer term than me. I mean, I'm sure they're out there. <clears throat> and I think uh, that's just uh, what my back test is and my, you know, my idea is that, okay, this, this looks great. I want to be longer term and I haven't set out to be longer term. Uh, it just happens, you know, it's just something that my analysis is, this is the right time frame. So the look back is going to be, you know, uh, a long time and my uh, holding periods, 12 months on average. So, but now, uh, so one can still have uh, twice that look back or be half as uh, active as me and still use daily data. Uh, so I like to use daily data. I haven't really been able to figure out how to calculate the ATR uh, that I want to use uh, off weekly data. And, but I do like to look at weekly data. So I think it's like two different things. Uh, regardless of how long-term I am, and I'm, I'm going to analyze my, the markets with my computers and decide my trades based upon daily. But I like looking at, uh, and, I advoc and I recommend that traders look at weekly charts, uh, <clears throat> continuous weekly charts. You can get those on some uh, systems or... Uh, just to see, you know, what is a what is a big trend? You know, is five ATR a big trend? Is ten 
there's some 50 and 100 and 200 ATR moves out there. And so it'll get your brain in a more of a good place where you say, ah, I see. So what happened this week is not that relevant. Exactly. What happened in gold eh, was painful, but it's not that relevant to the trend because you can see some of these sell-offs from 2006 in the gold and silver and copper. And, uh, you know, it had a long ways to go after the first retrace, nice retracement of five or 10 ATRs. So um, <clears throat> just get your brain in a good place to sort of uh, uh, remind yourself that most of the moves we see, painful as they are, they're not uh, significant. At least they haven't been historically in some of the larger moves. Um, Jacob continues with another question. He says, what is your opinion on the optimization of a strategy through an ideas first approach instead of a data first with more of a focus on a live trading track record as opposed to backtest. So, um, Jerry, we lost uh, Moritz for a little while. He might come back, but, um, an ideas first approach, uh, versus a data first approach. I don't think we use a data first approach i mean we always i mean we always have the idea of what to do uh, first and foremost so uh, but um any any thoughts anything we can um and i'm not even sure jacob what you mean with more of a focus on a live trading track record as opposed to backtest i think people who have been in business for a long time we we don't re i mean we don't show Back test to our, our clients, anyways. We we have to show the real data, even if our back, even if we have back test that looks greater. We normally do. There's never been a back, ba bad back test in uh, that comes to light, so to speak. So, um, so I'm not entirely sure what what you mean by that. Um, but would you agree, generally, uh, Jerry and and Moritz, that I mean, we come up with the ideas before we we start doing our research. It's not that we're trying to find the models based on data. Uh, that's more AI, I imagine. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, uh, <clears throat> I think that's the way to approach it. Um, like I was saying earlier, the consolidation before, you know, a sufficient amount of consolidation of false breakouts and choppiness in the market and sort of preferring markets that are have been uh, not trendy, you know, uh, is sort of like a behavioral finance type of thing, you know, let's probably you know uh once this bond long bond trade uh is hit its peak maybe people who missed it uh will want to get short at the highs and i think something like that's just probably not going to work it's probably going to it's not going to have a v top or a v bottom probably so i think coming in with those sort of ideas of what do human beings dislike about the markets <clears throat> and uh small losses frequent small losses uh, win percentages trade win percentages less than 50% uh, these are things that I think you sort of want to start with in your head and then see if they kind of work and build upon those ideas uh, versus uh, sort of data mining and, like like you said, AI and machine learning. Uh, I read an article this week where the second part of what uh, they like to do, people who do that type of thing, AI, ML, is to now can we find out reason why this is actually working? So it's probably better to start with, right. this is the way I think the markets kind of behave and work. It's trend, it's diversification, it's shorts, small losers, big profits. And then let's build on that. That's kind of uh, how we do it. And I've been doing it for so long, I have a tendency to forget that initially that that is the way I sort of looked at the markets. And I've been looking at them the same way for so long, so I really – don't usually think about that too much, except when I'm on the podcast. Yeah, no, no, I, I think that's 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 a very good point. Um, last question that Japa brings up uh, is uh, something that you may know more about than I do. But how do you feel about integration of value with trend following uh, with a trend following approach? Um, I know there's a lot of press, a lot of people who do maybe more multi strategy type products that they talk about that value strategies and trend following they work well together and you can see kind of if you visualize it a little bit um a lot of the quote-unquote value of a value approach happens initially of the trade right you're buying something that is in extremely undervalued so if your thesis is right then you get a lot of oomph and a lot of benefit 
you know, as soon as the market realized, yeah, that is too cheap, so let's just adjust that. So you get a lot of benefit right there and then. Often with trend following, I would say it's probably the opposite. There's not a lot of, you know, great uh, move necessarily right in the beginning, but sometimes when these trends end and, as Jerry say, they become, you know, many, many multiple ATRs and, and you get, like we're seeing maybe in the bond this year, you're getting this kind of um, euphoric move towards the end of the trend. So you can kind of philosophically say that maybe the reason why they would work together well is that they deliver some strong uh, return uh, returns at, at, at opposite sides of the trade, value in the beginning in particular, until it's not undervalued anymore, and trend towards the end of the trend when everybody, you know, jumps into to the trade um, and, and that's where it, it often finishes. So that's just one way of looking at it maybe. Don't know uh, whether you have some experience, uh, Jerry, in terms of value combined with the uh, trend. Honestly, I read a lot about value because people write a lot about it. I don't think I know exactly what it is, uh, primarily because I've never seen them list the rules. Right. So if it's not rules-based, I don't like it. You shouldn't like it. Uh, it hasn't worked for a long time if we're talking stocks. Um, I don't know. It probably has never worked, probably. I don't know. if it Does it really work? I, I'm skeptical. Without rules that I can back test, I'm not a fan. Um, but I think there's two ways to look at this. Uh, could be You can replace value with something other than trend following. Uh, so I think to some degree it's okay and it's, and it's, it's, it's a good idea to have your trend following model with, you know, half your money and then the other half could be your value model. And since value is different from trend, then this could add some diversification and increased, uh, you know, similar returns to trend following, hopefully, but a smaller drawdown and smaller, uh, standard deviation. So now you've got to have those rules for the value, whatever mean reversion, carry trade, um, pattern recognition, whatever it is, value uh, to add, you know, to trade uh, maybe 25% of your money or half your money or whatever, you know. So that's perfectly fine. But you can't kind of mix the two. You can't sort of say, um, okay, I have these trend following signals and they kick in when the value signal confirms it. So nothing is going to be able to help out the trend following uh, by polluting the signals. So I would never be in favor of that. And I would say that if value works, if you have a systematic approach to value or anything, uh, probably adding the trend following piece to it as well. Okay, we'll buy when the value says we should buy, but it has to make a 20 day high or whatever. That probably is not going to help either. So you wanna keep them separate and apart to do their own thing uh, just like I have system one, system two, system three, system four, and I trade them all as separate. And so I think separate, it could, it's possible, but you know, we're not going to, this podcast, all of us guys, we're not, it, it's in our name. It has to be systematic. Well, we hope to bring you value, of course, but it's a different kind of value than uh, what you were asking about, uh, Jacob, but I hope it was useful. Uh, Morris, let's see if you can tune in on this one. I know you had a little bit of a technical uh, challenge, but we have one more question left, and that's actually from Adrian, who will be joining us in New York in just three weeks' time. So very much looking forward to that. And uh, Adrian is asking, one question I would like to ask the panel is related to the concept of discipline. So what does discipline mean to all of you, and how do you stay disciplined? Uh, well, I think uh, to me, it's uh, following the rules. And every single time um, you have a signal to buy or sell, you do that trade. And then you have your rules, like we spoke about, about execution or rolling the contracts on a continuous contract or whatever. Then you're just continuing to uh, follow those rules. Now, I think it's perfectly fine to, after you've done your great research and your back test and you've come up with a new idea, uh, that wasn't just uh, number crunching and you've 
Okay, so now you've got a new set of rules. Now carry those forward forever or for as long as you want until you come up with an improved version of your set of rules. So I think it's also important that you can build into your system a lack of discipline as well. Uh, so you want to be careful that the system is uh, robust and following the strategy. Uh, <clears throat> whenever you have uh, a rule that says I'm going to buy – you know, if A happens and B happens, I think that's okay. Um, but if you have a rule that says I'm going to buy if A happens or if B happens, that's problematic because you're reducing your sample size quite a bit and you're not being consistent and you're not handling the trades the same way each time. Sometimes you buy at A, sometimes you buy at B. So I think that is a way that uh, an, an undisciplined approach can creep into the rules themselves. So just by following rules, uh, however necessary it is, is, is not uh, it maybe enough discipline. You can have uh, undisciplined rules. Yeah, no, that's true. But what I would add to that, Adrian, is that I completely agree, of course, with Jerry. You know, discipline is doing the trades and all of that stuff. That's one thing. I think you need to take the concept a little bit further. I think you need to have discipline in everything you do in terms of your your research as well. I mean, you need to be incredibly disciplined about how you do your research. Don't cut any corners, even if you if it's tempting. You know, do the work. Uh, you know, and 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 do the 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 testing, do the paper trading, do you know, do all of those steps. Never cut a corner. I think that's equally important when it comes to discipline. Yeah, like Jerry said, follow the rules. But I think, you know, what's important is that it's always extremely easy to stay disciplined if you have a good run. Staying disciplined is so, you know, it's it, it's super easy when you're making money every day, every month, right? It comes, you know, the difficult points come when you're in a drawdown, when you're losing money, when there's a series of days that give you pain. And, and the trick here is to to stay disciplined, to follow the rules. And some of the tricks that we have mentioned, or at least tricks that I think, you know, we use to do that and achieve that is to, you know, first of all, look at the track record of your system for a longer period of time, and then put the current environment, the current loss in perspective, vis-a-vis -vis what has happened in the past five years, in the past 10 years, or in your case, Niels, even in the past 35 or, you know, 45 years, uh, however far you can go and, and see if, you know, what you're seeing today is really anything that's out of the ordinary. And then also one of the things that I do, and it's just been those past weeks have, I think, been a great example again of this when, you know, we lost the money on the bonds. And it's kind of like remind yourself that those things happen and that there have been instances in the past where similar events have happened of similar magnitude and that you've recovered from them and that there are, you know, sunnier days ahead, and sometimes it only takes a couple of days before you recover the loss, as, by the way, has just been the case. You know, I, I think I've, I'm now back at, you know, an, an all-time high in terms of making money from the bonds this year. Um, I've, I've probably more than recovered my loss, or just about there. So it's, you know, what has that been? Three weeks? Two weeks? And it's funny you say that, March, because I remember that week. I remember that conversation. I think a lot of our listeners will remember that conversation because there was a lot of there was a lot of emotion in the air that that weekend we talked about because it was a tough week to get through, even though we all said at the time, well, you know, in a few weeks' time we don't even remember it. And I think that's exactly right. What you're describing there is that you don't even think about it now because you know it was a one week event and and you're back to where you were before it it even happened and uh, so life moves on um but of course you make a great point uh, that discipline is discipline throughout the 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 good times but most importantly throughout the bad times because what you want to avoid is to react to a tough time and make changes on a whim to your system that's probably the worst thing you you can do that's what I meant by make sure you do the research and 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 do don't cut any corners, because it has to be based on research every time you change your model. Because every time you do, there is a chance that you're going to get it wrong. So uh, so so be be careful about that. Um, any thoughts on your side, uh, Jerry? Or I really like the part about the research. Yeah, have a team, a group. You've got a process. You're going to do the research. It's not going to be an emotionally driven thing analyze the trades, analyze how you handled these situations. 
uh, the big trades especially, uh, <clears throat> and come to a conclusion, hopefully as a group. Uh, but yeah, that's a very, very important part. Great question, uh, Adrian, and we'll see you in a few weeks. Uh, unless you have questions before, of course, feel free to send them. As usual, we want, we encourage you to send us questions. Um, and uh, as, as usual, you can send them to info at toptradersonplug.com and we'll do our very best to bring them on the first occasion uh, in terms of recording. Um, while uh, the two of you think about anything else you want to bring up, let me run through the numbers. Uh, these are as of Thursday evening, as usual. I think Friday, yesterday was a good day, a positive day for CTAs in general. But as of Thursday, we were a little bit down for the month when, when we talk about the indices. Uh, the BTOP50 index was down 107 uh, for the month of October, up 79 uh, for the year. Sokja NCT index down 1.17 for the month, up 7.3 for the year. The Sokja trend index down 1.38 for the month and uh, up 12.08 for the year. And the Sokja short-term traders index bucking the trend here up to 0.27% uh, for the month uh, and up 2.09% for the year. And then the bridge alternatives, the the cheap uh, replicator, uh, I was about to say, but the, the cheap funds, meaning the flat fee funds, um, they were down 0 0.59 for the month and up 11.27 for the year. So, Jerry, Martz, any final thoughts as we uh, bring this conversation to, to a close? It's been a long time since I've said happy trading, but I mean it. So uh, looking forward to seeing everyone in about three weeks' time. Yeah, um, um, just the world's worst at final thoughts, but uh, I'm glad Moritz <laughs> is back. We'll uh, see you next week. Absolutely, we'll speak next week. And, um, you know, with that, let's wrap up this uh, conversation. As usual, you can find, um, you know, notes and, and stuff like that uh, at the top traders and plot, uh, dot com pot, uh, website, I should say. So uh, from Jerry, Moritz and me, thanks for listening. And until next time, buy high and sell low. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the